hiding behind a veil of feminist rhetoric does not change that. Because that is a rhetoric that is consistently misused and abused by white male elites as moral cover for their wars. I want to talk about two things in this speech. Firstly, why even the best case interventions disproportionately harm women and why as feminists we should oppose that. Secondly, why it is that we, we on this, unless we do this policy, we need to use this to maintain the ability of the feminist movement to critique the male establishment in these cases. Firstly then, we say that even the best case interventions disproportionately harm women and we think that the feminist movement should take a stance against that. We think this is an analysis debate, we think it's about saying what we as feminists believe. So, what, in what ways are these wounds stacked against women? We firstly want to assume that these are good faith interventions, that the people within them genuinely care about the women that they claim to help. The first harm is we say that these wars disproportionately harm civilians. We note that women mo are like disproportionately uh, made up, make up the civilian population in these cases, and we think that when these bomb aerial bombardments happen, they are disproportionately effective. Moreover, we think that given that they are less likely to be part of military forces or military agents, we think they are less able to defend themselves in these situations. Secondly, we think that wars and, and interventions are marked... Not, not, yeah, go on. Are you fine with feminist charities and NGOs supporting military interventions and providing aid to women on the ground? So we're happy for them to provide military aid, provided there's no direct association with the war. So potentially in order to mitigate some of the ill effects, we are happy for those charities to be there on the ground. But we do not want them to make public statements supporting that. We do not think they should like, provide um, any aid for the military operations that are going on. I hope that's clear. So secondly, we think the interventions are marked by breakdowns in law and order within these states. Typically, wars destroy infrastructure, they destroy societies. Sometimes, in the long term, there are benefits from those systems. But in the meantime, what happens is normal systems that prevent the worst atrocities against the most vulnerable people break down. And overwhelmingly, the most vulnerable people are women in these societies, given that that is the reason why we claim to be going in in the first place. So we think the counterproductive effect of going in, even when we mean to do well, is that we break down law and order and, like, and atrocities and mass rapes happen and we cannot, we cannot prevent those. The third thing we say is that we end up inevitably empowering hardliners. We're going to talk about two cases of states here. The first is when we overthrow secular states. We think the vacuum in many cases is filled by religious opposition. So in Egypt, when, the Muslim, so when um, Mubarak was toppled, we know that Muslim Brotherhood took their place. We think those type of groups are often far more hostile to, to women and women's rights in these, in these communities. But the second type of case is when we overthrow religious states. We think that we, what we do and when we do that is we rally potentially disparate religious factions around around anti-Westernism, and we think we cohere them to make them more powerful. We think the backlash that always exists when we do that, when we go into um, like, um, Islamic states and that already have like, incredible amounts of hostility towards Western intervention, means we empower the very religious movements that are likely to increasingly restrict religious rights. So we note the fact that the Taliban are still in control of Afghanistan despite 10 years of being there. That hasn't worked. Fourthly, what we say is we take the pro-feminist movements that do exist on the ground in many of these states. So there are Iranian feminists that are making enormous progress in terms of tra transforming um, attitudes to towards women in these, in these countries and changing legislation towards, towards marriage and other things. We think that it's undermined when they are tainted by Western interventions, when they're that association they cannot escape from because we Westerners are coming in and giving them a leg up in those situations. We think it undermines the progress that they would be making when we do this. The second type of category we want to think about in this debate is when those interventions do not take place with such good faith, when the people who claim to support them actually have ulterior agendas. The first thing we want to point out here is that there are few women and feminists in government. That is incredibly regrettable, but it means that the decision-making procedures in these places are overwhelmingly staffed and run by men, which means that when, they make, when the, these discussions happen, they never see these issues as a priority, even when they tick um, when they check those issues in order to make the case for war. So the point is, even when they claim to you be using that rhetoric, in the end, they do not see the, uh, building women's schools as a priority in these cases, which means that inevitably these issues fall out of that debate. And when it comes down to it, what matters is military strategy. It's about winning that war rather than ensuring that women right. are taken care of in these cases. So even when that exists, that 
um, incentive to talk about these issues exists in the first place, it falls out of the debate. And Afghanistan is a prime example of that, where in the end, we traded women's rights for a security pact that means we can get out of that country. Women have not been helped by that, by that. No. Thirdly, there is a degree of cultural blindness that exists when we, in terms of these interventions. We often assume that Afghan women want exactly what Western women want. That is not the case in every situation. There are some instances where there is, a, there is a degree of uniformity. But we think it's very possible that Afghan women are more interested in certain types of religious freedom than um, certain types of Western women right. may be interested in these debates. No. We say, therefore, that when we go in as, as Westerners and we tell them what's best, we think that is not something we should be doing. We think the duty of feminists mm, really. is not to simply serve white Western women, but we have to consider the individual lived experiences of women and the different things that they prioritise. That is definitely something that we should care about as feminists. Lastly, I want to talk about why it is important to maintain the ability of right. feminists to critique the establishment. No thanks. The first thing to say here is that we have given you multiple reasons now to believe that women are systematically excluded from really? intervention discourses. That when we talk about these issues, we don't seriously consider what is going to happen and who is going to be impacted really? in these situations, which makes us naive at best and worse negligent. What we say is that given really? that, the only people, no thank you, the only people genuinely looking out for these issues are likely to be feminists and women in these situations. Which means that the only way we, we can make these, um, make these wars to be, have a better gendered impact is to have them within that discourse and have them criticising the structures of power that allow war and violence to take place. But what happens and, um, at the moment? The problem is that unless we take a stance against those, against those conflicts, we then, so when we take a stance on those conflicts and we endorse them, we become pegged to those conflicts. And in so doing, we neuter the ability to criticise interventions when they fail. We become tainted as feminists and we've endorsed Afghanistan and it's, and it's ultimately been counterproductive for women and gender. So to, in order to give us that detachment from these issues, to critique the very elites that are ultimately likely to push their interests rather than the interests of women in these situations, we need that detachment. We need to be able to say, we need to be able to say these wars are wrong and we do not endorse what is happening. The only way they could do that on their side is to admit that they were at the very best naive and they got it wrong. That is not something that plays well because people aren't likely to believe you when you, when you have admitted that you didn't understand what was going on in these situations. The best way to critique these elites was to say, to have a clear, unequivocal stance that said that these wars would be systematically misused in the vast majority of cases. We are very proud to propose.